1951 is rarely a prominent year for many to choose when talking about the Cold War. And yet, like any year, it had more than its fair share of events, whether those were cultural, political, military, or otherwise. In our ongoing series looking at specific years during the tumultuous time between 1945 and 1991, today we are going to talk about some of the events and occurrences in what can often be an overlooked year. I'm your host David, and today we are going all the way back to 1951. This is The Cold War. We'll start our roundup in the United Kingdom, where on October 25th, a familiar face returned to power in a general election when Winston Churchill's Conservatives beat Clement Attlee's Labour Party in a snap election. Attlee had been in power since 1945 and had spent the last six years implementing many of the social policies of the modern British welfare state, including the creation of the National Health Service. However, after six years, many of the key promises of 1945 had already been fulfilled and the party was losing some of its direction. This was evident from the 1950 general election, where the Conservatives had gained seats, although not enough to form the government, leaving Labour with a slim five-seat majority. King George VI, planning to leave on a Commonwealth tour, was concerned over the stability of Attlee's government, seemingly unable to manage numerous challenges through 1951, including unrest in Iran, Egypt and Sudan, the negative economic impact of paying for British participation in the Korean War, and the black eye caused by the defection of Guy Burgess and Donald McLean. Attlee called the snap election to reassure the king of his government's stability. In a close-fought campaign centered largely on economic and foreign policy issues, the Conservative Party emerged victorious with a 17-seat majority despite losing the popular vote. They would remain in power in the United Kingdom for the next 13 years. Now, moving from the United Kingdom, but remaining within the British Empire, we are going to move south to Africa to the colonial territory of Tanganyika and an attempt to grow some nuts or more specifically, the 1951 abandonment of the Tanganyika groundnut scheme, an attempt by Great Britain to not only increase the global supply of cooking fats and oils by growing peanuts, but increase the economic strength of the territory as well. The scheme was originally proposed in 1946 by the head of the United Africa Company, Frank Samuel, and a three-month study concluded that Tanganyika, modern-day Tanzania, would be a suitable site, allowing for 3.21 million acres of land to be used for growing groundnuts by 1952. The plan was launched in 1947 with high expectations. The study, however, had failed to take into account such things as poor soil for peanuts, unsuitable rainfall patterns for peanuts, and poor transportation for the agricultural equipment needed to clear the acreage to grow peanuts. It also failed to account for a local sentiment, which often did not want the land cleared due to cultural significance and ancestor worship, which involved the land. By 1948, costs were spiraling with no results to show for them. In 1949, two years into the project, a mere 2,000 tons of peanuts were harvested, the results of both flooding and drought. By 1950, the Atlee government was under strong criticism, with only 47,000 acres having been cleared, well short of the projected 3 million plus acres. On January 9, 1951, the Atlee government closed the books on the project, writing off over 36 million pounds, equivalent to about 1 billion pounds in 2024. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago the defection of Guy Burgess and Don McLean, the spy, not the singer. These two key members of the Cambridge Five, the name given to a ring of spies who had been recruited to work for the NKVD during the 1930s. After graduating, they each went on to highly promising careers working for both the Foreign Office and British intelligence, while passing highly sensitive information along to their Soviet handlers. British counterintelligence at the time was lax, despite multiple indiscretions from both of the spies, often related to their heavy drinking. 
despite warning from the American FBI, who had, thanks to the top secret Venona project, determined that there was a Soviet spy operating from the British Embassy in Washington, D.C., the British largely ignored the warnings, believing that the men of good family backgrounds and education, members of the ruling class, could not possibly be spies. By 1951, McLean was back in London, but the Americans had all but identified that he was the spy. Kim Philby, another member of the spy ring, himself serving as the CIA, FBI, NSA liaison in Washington, had seen the Venona data and realized that McLean was about to be burned. He coordinated with Burgess to have Burgess recalled to London to warn McLean. This was done by Burgess earning three substantial speeding tickets in a single day and being recalled due to a personal complaint from the governor of Virginia. By the end of May 1951, plans had been arranged. McLean and Burgess had a meal at McLean's home and then left, taking a ferry to France and then traveling onwards to Moscow. Although their defection was not officially confirmed until 1956, Britain had taken a rather severe reputational black eye. We've done a series of videos looking at the Cambridge Five, make sure to check them out for more information. Now, speaking of spies, 1951 was the year that Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were put on trial in the United States for a violation of Section 2 of the Espionage Act of 1917, transmitting information relating to national defense to a foreign government. They were part of the group of Soviet spies who had access to top secret US military information, specifically related to the Manhattan Project, the American Atomic Bomb Project. The arrest of Klaus Fuchs in 1950 set in motion a chain of events that served to increase Cold War tensions and fuel anti-communist paranoia across the United States. Klaus Fuchs identified Harry Gold as his courier, which then led to the arrest of David Greenglass, who had also passed information on to Gold. Greenglass identified his sister Ethel's husband, Julius Rosenberg, as the person who had recruited him as a spy, resulting in the arrest of both Julius and Ethel during the summer of 1950. The March 1951 trial saw evidence given by Greenglass that the Rosenbergs had delivered atomic secrets to the Soviet Union, including sketches of the Fat Man bomb. Both Julius and Ethel were found guilty and subsequently sentenced to death. Somewhat controversially, Ethel was included in this death sentence, a sentence some feel was excessive relative to the minor role she played and based on the somewhat mixed testimony provided during the 1950 grand jury. The Rosenbergs were the only American civilians executed for espionage during the Cold War. And keeping with the nuclear theme, but moving west, 1951 saw the first set of Desert Rock operations conducted at the Nevada Proving Ground. These were atomic tests conducted by the Los Alamos National Laboratory in coordination with US Army units to help develop combat maneuvers on an atomic battlefield. Establishing a staging camp named Desert Rock, 6,500 troops were dispatched to the Nevada desert to build fortifications and defensive emplacements approximately 10 kilometers away from Ground Zero. On November 1st, the dog shot of Operation Jangle tested a 21 kiloton Mark IV bomb set for airburst to minimize fallout. Following the detonation, Operation Desert Rock 1 saw soldiers bust forwards to the area with the fortifications to observe the effects of the detonation, in some cases coming as near as one kilometer from ground zero. Further tests followed and saw Desert Rock 2 and 3 carried out, although troops were not allowed to approach too closely to the detonation site as they were ground burst tests and had produced high levels of fallout. The Desert Rock tests, which continued through the 1950s, were designed to assist the US military in developing battlefield techniques of maneuver on ground that had seen atomic detonations. They also assisted in developing radiological safety equipment, decontamination procedures for contaminated personnel and equipment, and finally evaluated the psychological reactions to soldiers witnessing and then operating in an atomic environment. 1951 also saw the signature of the Treaty of San Francisco, the document that would formally end the war in the Pacific. Well, except for all those countries who either weren't invited or refused to sign, including either of the Chinas and the Soviet Union. Oh yeah, and Korea. But it was signed by 49 countries on the 8th of September and was set to come into effect in April of 1952. 
Key aspects of the treaty were the official ending of the Allied occupation of Japan and the restoration of full Japanese sovereignty, the renunciation of Japan as an imperial power, as well as an agreement on compensation payments to Allied nations and prisoners of war for the damage and suffering caused by Japan during the war. It also saw Japanese acceptance of the verdicts of the Allied war crimes tribunals. What it did not see, however, was a clear resolution on the status of Taiwan, as in was it independent as a former Japanese colony after 1945, or was it automatically retroceded to be part of mainland China? This obviously added fuel to the Two Chinas debate that started after the communist victory on the mainland in 1949. The treaty also did not address compensation for South Korea, as they were not invited, the result of a lack of agreement whether the North or the South was the valid Korean representative. The refusal of the Soviet Union to sign the treaty was the result of both territorial disputes over the Kuril Islands and South Sakhalin, but generally over Soviet objections to not being consulted in the drafting of the treaty itself. Although it would be several more years before Japan and the USSR would normalize relations, the Treaty of San Francisco was a major step forward in the global normalization of the post-war order. And now, speaking of Korea, 1951 saw the war on the peninsula continue to rage. Starting with the Third Phase Offensive, otherwise known as the Chinese New Year's Offensive, the year began with a combined Chinese and North Korean assault, which saw Seoul recaptured by communist forces and UN forces pushed back down the peninsula. This offensive, which lasted through January, was forced to halt and then fall back due to a lack of logistical support. UN forces, under the command of General Matthew Ridgway, went on the offensive, reaching the Han River. February saw the Communist Fourth Phase Offensive blunted and broken at the Battle of Chipyongni, where 5,600 French and American troops held off and defeated a force of approximately 25,000 Chinese and Korean soldiers. March saw a resumed UN offensive recapture a now largely destroyed Seoul. April saw General Ridgway take over as Supreme Commander in Korea after General Dugout Doug MacArthur was relieved of command. More on that shortly. Ridgway planned for a series of counterattacks designed to hold and trap communist forces while the UN advanced. The Chinese launched their own attacks in April, the fifth phase offensive, but were halted by UN victories at the Battle of the Imjin River and the Battle of Kapyong. By the end of May, the fifth phase offensive had ended, but before they could withdraw, UN forces launched their own offensive, causing tremendous further casualties to an already depleted Chinese force. The lines that were reached and established by June of 1951 were largely those that remained in place for the remainder of the war as Korea descended into a stalemate. Okay, back to MacArthur. In April of 1951, one of the more controversial and also misunderstood events of the Korean War, and possibly even of the Cold War itself, occurred the relieving of General Douglas MacArthur from overall command in Korea. MacArthur, the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers in Japan and the Commander of Far East Command, has often been styled as a military genius, especially if you read MacArthur's own press. Although he was responsible for the weakened state of Allied forces in Korea at the time of the North Korean invasion, the brilliant amphibious landings at Incheon were his brainchild and allowed UN forces to break North Korean forces and advance well north of the 38th parallel, almost to the Yalu River. This prompted the Chinese to intervene, the advance signs of which MacArthur had ignored, resulting in the 8th Army being forced to retreat 275 miles, the longest US retreat in its history. But this wasn't why he was relieved, nor was it for his calls for the use of nuclear weapons. Instead, it was for a refusal to align his policies to that of the civilian government. MacArthur was under strict orders to not attack China directly, but MacArthur also seemed determined to expand the war, making public statements to that effect. This publicly called into question if Truman and the civilian government were actually in control of the military. Although there is no evidence that MacArthur ever directly violated any orders from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, it was evident that MacArthur and the Truman administration were not on the same page when it came to the conduct of the war, and he was relieved of command on that basis. 
On July 28, 1951, the Convention Relating to the Status of Refugees was signed, a UN treaty that, among other things, provided for a definition for who could be a refugee and stipulated the rights and responsibilities of both refugees and asylum nations. The convention became a defining document regarding refugee policy in the post-war period, including its incorporation into European Union law, and remains a key, albeit increasingly contentious, set of guidelines in the present day. The convention defined a refugee as someone who, quote, as a result of events occurring before 1st of January 1951 and owing to well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality and is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country or who, not having a nationality and being outside the country of his former habitual residence as a result of such events, is unable or owing to such fear is unwilling to return to it. In 1967, the protocol relating to the status of refugees reaffirmed this definition but removed the stipulation regarding events happening before January 1, 1951. Among the responsibilities of the refugee claimant is the need to report themselves to local authorities as promptly as possible, as well as to abide by national laws in the host country. In exchange, the host country is obliged to protect the refugee under local laws, provide access to courts, identity papers, and travel documents as necessitated, and provide the possibility of assimilation and naturalization. The host also pledges to not discriminate against refugees and to not refoul refugees, meaning to not send them to a state where there would be improbable danger of persecution on the basis of their race, religion, nationality, or membership of a particular social or political group. Turning our attention to South Asia, 1951 saw the formation of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, one of the leading political parties on the island. When Ceylon achieved its independence from Britain in 1948, it still not only retained British troops at the port of Trincomalee, but was struggling to settle on an accepted place for the substantial Tamil minority in the country. Solomon West Ridgeway Diaz, SWRD, Bandura Nayaka, established the Sri Lanka Freedom Party with the intent of representing left-leaning Sinhalese on the island. The platform, realized after the party's election to power for the first time in 1956, was based around the removal of British forces, a move towards the non-aligned movement in international politics, and an increase in social programs and local education. The SLFP also championed Sinhalese nationalism, including language policy, making Sinhala the official language in 1956. This often came at the expense of the Tamil minority. After SRWD's assassination in 1959, his widow Sirimavo Bandaranayaka became leader of the party, becoming in 1960 the world's first female elected head of government. The SLFP remains one of the most prominent political parties in Sri Lanka, having been part of the government or the opposition since participating in its first elections in 1952. 1951 also witnessed the signing of the Treaty of Paris, establishing the European Coal and Steel Community. These six signatories, France, Germany, Belgium, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, agreed to create a common market for coal and steel, looking to rationalize the distribution of production of these goods while increasing employment and living standards at the same time. Given that several of these countries had been engaged in a bitter and devastating war only six years before, the Treaty of Paris has been hailed as an enormous step in diplomatic reconciliation. The ECSC is often regarded as the key institution that would eventually lead to the formation of the European Community and subsequently the European Union. Moving away from politics, 1951 was a landmark moment in the field of digital electronics with the agreement to purchase the UNIVAC-1 by the United States Census Bureau. While not the first general purpose electronic digital computer, that was ENIAC in 1945, UNIVAC-1 was the first one to be produced in the United States. It was designed by John Presper Eckert and John Mockley of the firm Eckert Mockley Computer Corporation, which was purchased by Remington Rand before the sale to the Census Bureau was made. 
UNIVAC was designed largely for relatively straightforward arithmetic and data transport operations and could conduct 1,905 operations per second, but was in no way portable as it used 6,103 vacuum tubes, required 382 square feet of floor space, and weighed in at 16,500 pounds. The primary data input method for UNIVAC was not punch cards, as you might expect, but rather a tape drive. An add-on device was made available to allow for punch cards to be converted to magnetic tape, allowing the UNIVAC to compete commercially with other punch card computers available at the time. The UNIVAC computer sold to the Census Bureau was not the first to be installed, however, as it was retained as a display model waiting until 1952, after a UNIVAC-1 had already been installed at the Pentagon for the US Air Force. Incidentally, it is believed that the UNIVAC-1 version of Skyrim will be made available later this year. In the world of psychology, 1951 saw the publication of the Ash Conformity Experiments conducted at Swarthmore College, examining how individuals either yielded to or defied a majority opinion of a wider social group. Solomon Ash was looking to improve methodology on research looking at social suggestibility. The basis of the experiment was a simple line test, where a group of eight people was each asked to identify which of three lines was the longest. One of the eight was the real participant, who was always made to give their answer last, while the other seven had agreed beforehand, and without the knowledge of the real participant, to all answer the same obviously incorrect answer. Each participant went through 18 rounds, of which the first six all gave correct answers before deviating to the incorrect answer. What was found was that 32% of participants conformed to the incorrect answer, 75% conformed at least once, while only 25% never conformed. In the control group, by contrast, where there were no prearranged incorrect answers, less than 1% of participants gave the wrong response. When questioned after the experiment, participants admitted they knew the response was wrong, but feared ridicule or being thought peculiar. The Ash Conformity experiments have formed the basis of a great deal of further study on patterns of social coercion. Musically, 1951 may have seen the first rock and roll record laid down and recorded when Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats recorded and released Rocket 88 at Memphis Recording Service. In reality, it was Jackie Brenston on vocals. The band playing was in reality Ike Turner and his Kings of Rhythm. Released that year on the chess label, Rocket 88 topped the Billboard R&B charts for five weeks that summer. Stylistically, the song is a combination of jump blues and swing, while lyrically, it's simply an ode to the Oldsmobile Rocket 88 recently introduced. What sets the song apart, however, and has made it a contender to possibly be the world's first rock and roll song, is the somewhat fuzzy sound produced from one of the amplifiers, which was damaged while being transported to the recording studio. The claims to be the first rock and roll song have also been amplified by the owner of Memphis Recording Service, Sam Phillips, who liked to style himself as the man who popularized rock and roll. Ike Turner, to go to the source, stated, I don't think that Rocket 88 is rock and roll. I think that Rocket 88 is R&B, but I think Rocket 88 is the cause of rock and roll existing. Turning to literature, 1951 saw the publication of J.D. Salinger's The Catcher in the Rye, a novel that so many teens over the years have read and fallen in love with for its themes of angst, alienation, and rebellion, only to go back and reread as an adult to discover that its protagonist is a phony. Or maybe that's just me. Anyways, the story follows the course of a weekend spent by 16-year-old Holden Caulfield, who, after being expelled from his preparatory school, spends a weekend in New York City brooding and musing about his life and relationship to the things around him. At the time of its publication, the book was very well received by many critics, and it has gone on to sell millions of copies globally, having been translated into multiple languages, and is consistently listed among the best books of the 20th century. It has, however, also received its fair share of criticism, both from literary critics, who accuse the writing style of being terrible, and from parents who dislike the content, which includes vulgar language, sexuality, alcohol abuse, and poor family values. Some of the most stern criticism, however, has come from adults, including myself, who consider Holden to be, in retrospect, a whiny, self-centered, and generally unpleasant protagonist. 
Incidentally, the Catcher in the Rye has been associated to several shootings and murders, including Ronald Reagan's would-be assassin John Hinckley Jr. and John Lennon's murderer Mark David Chapman. In my opinion, this is a book that every older teen should read and then move past. Just one host's opinion, of course. So as we move to wrap up this look at 1951, we'll take our customary look at popular films and music, as well as some of the sports winners of the year. The highest grossing film in the United States that year was the Roman epic Quo Vadis, earning $11.1 million at the box office and starring Robert Taylor, Deborah Kerr, Leo Jen, and Peter Ustinov. The top Soviet film that year was In Peaceful Time, a story about Soviet submariners in peacetime and their war with foreign intelligence agents, and starred Nikolai Timofeyev, Arkady Tolbuzin, and Vyacheslav Tikhonov, Stirlitz himself. An American in Paris won the Oscar for Best Film, Vivian Lee won the Oscar for her performance in A Streetcar Named Desire, and Humphrey Bogart won Best Actor for The African Queen. In the world of music, the number one song on the Billboard charts was Too Young, sung by Nat King Cole with Les Baxter, but my personal favorite from that year is Patti Page's rendition of Tennessee Waltz. In sports, the Los Angeles Rams beat the Cleveland Browns to win the NFL championship, while the Toronto Maple Leafs beat the Montreal Canadiens over five games. In the NBA Finals, the Rochester Royals beat the Knicks four games to three, while the World Series was won by the Yankees, beating the New York Giants four games to two. In Canadian football, the Ottawa Rough Riders beat the Saskatchewan Rough Riders to win the Grey Cup, ensuring that the Rough Riders won. The 57th Five Nations Championship was won by Ireland, while Hugo Koblet of Switzerland won the Tour de France. And finally, in that funny old game, Atletico won La Liga, Milan secured the Serie A title, Nice secured the title in France, the FA Cup was lifted by Newcastle, and in the English First Division, playing in the top flight for the first time since 1935, Tottenham Hotspur won the league under manager Arthur Rowe. Come on, you Spurs. And that was 1951. As always, I will remind you that this is only a brief snapshot of the year, with us not talking about many, many of the other things that happened. These episodes are only meant to give a general flavor. And despite my saying that, I'm sure you will let us know in the comments what we didn't cover. We do hope you've enjoyed this episode, so to ensure you don't miss any of our future work, please be sure to press the like and subscribe button, and even more importantly, press the bell button who is currently trying to grow nuts in inappropriate places. Please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash thecoldwar or through YouTube membership. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. And as we talk about the Cold War, please remember that history is shades of grey and rarely black and white.